So the last slat a lot of us heard about Microsoft's fortunes in Japan was probably around about last year when an article circulated stating that the Xbox One had sold 99 units in a single week. Sure, said week was in January, typically a somewhat barren month, and on average the sales for Xbox Ones tended to hover around the 300 to 500 mark at the time, but still those numbers are kind of grim. Consider that the Wii U, a machine that most people consider to be a failure, sold just over 15,000 units in that same week. There's not much to shout about really, and Microsoft by this point have long given up on trying to break into Japan. But that wasn't always the case, they really did give it a shot, first with the Xbox and then with the 360. This video will focus on that story, and in particular on two of the more prominent artifacts from Microsoft's push into Japan, Blue Dragon and Lost Odyssey, two RPGs produced by the Mistwalker Studio. First off, let's look at the background. When Microsoft launched into the console market in 2001, they could be considered outsiders everywhere. They were, after all, a Western-made company going into a market entirely dominated by Japanese companies, Sony, Nintendo, and the soon-to-drop-out Sega. But in Japan, things were even more stacked from the off. While a way that they'd made their name in gaming at all barely even existed there. PC gaming, particularly multiplayer PC gaming in the way that we know it, was not a thing in Japan, at all. Multiplayer gaming was, and still is, a lot more communal, based on getting together around consoles or playing on mobiles and handhelds and so forth, with more of an emphasis on communal games where people work together like, say, Monster Hunter, not more competitive games. What the Xbox offered was thus always going to be seen as something quite alien to the Japanese market, which was one of the issues that would face it. Because of this, they always ended up running against Japanese considerations from every angle. There's the commercial, such as the Xbox putting surface scratches onto discs that greatly hurt their value in the resale market, which is huge in Japan. The aesthetics never jived at first, the console and particularly the controller, until the controller S came along, were far too big and heavy. There's the traditional and superstitious, people warned Microsoft that the letter X was seen as a mark of bad fortune in Japan. And the entirely practical, Later on, when Microsoft launched the Kinect, it was hoped that it would grab some of the more communal Japanese multiplayer market, but it was rejected wholly due to the amount of space that the Kinect required being too large for most Japanese flats and apartments. In the beginning, there was also the lack of connections to the Japanese games industry. A lot of this was because of how much they were seen as outsiders and the differences between East and West. While some of the aforementioned negatives that hurt the Xbox in Japan were serious, Others like the letter X fin were more impressed upon them by those who didn't take them seriously. Microsoft were also advised that black wasn't a sellable colour for a console in Japan, which confused them when they looked at the primary colour of the all-conquering PS2. Yet they did kinda miss that multicoloured editions of consoles were a bigger deal in Japan than they perhaps were in Europe or America. The amount of companies signing up to Microsoft would remain small, although there were a few that did join their cause. Microsoft and Sega had a connection due to Microsoft developing a special version of Windows for the Dreamcast, which helped when Sega moved wholly into software. There was a Konami connection thanks to a PC port of Metal Gear Solid, and a Tecmo connection due to Seamus Blackley, one of the architects of the Xbox in Japan, friendship with Tomonobu Itagaki, creator of Dead or Alive and, later on, the Xbox exclusive Ninja Gaiden. Namco would also soon get on board, having again had a connection with Microsoft in the past through classic arcade ports. Others were trickier and just didn't work out. When Shinji Mikami was pushing Resident Evil away from PlayStation, Microsoft tried to get him, but the meeting broke down. A meeting with Square also broke down for similar reasons, there just wasn't a good connection between them. And no doubt, lots of other studios simply didn't want to make that many overtures to Microsoft because they didn't want to piss off the dominant Sony. Still, Microsoft tried their hardest in the Xbox generation, a big launch at the Tokyo Game Show in 2001, headed by no lesser figure than Bill Gates himself, where potential Japanese-friendly games such as Panzer Dragoon Auto, Gun Valkyrie, Dead or Alive 3 and Jet Set Radio Future were announced, along with an Xbox Japan division headed by Toshiyuki Miyata, formerly of Sony. It would have been a great sales pitch at an E3, but the Japanese still didn't really take to it because such big and grandiose sales pitches weren't particularly in fashion at these events, and because Gates went somewhat off the cuff in his speech, deviating from what had been vetted by the TGS's organisers. All of these little fins added up really, 
not necessarily turning people away in the shops, but turning studios and developers away from working with Microsoft. It should be said that it's not like there's anything wrong with the Japan-centric games that Xbox did have. The aforementioned games are all pretty damn solid, of that there's no doubt. There was an attempt at getting a more Japanese-friendly mascot too, Blinks the Time Sweeper, made by Nao Tuoshima's Artoon. It wasn't a particularly good game, but they were trying. The revamped 3D Ninja Gaiden is an obvious action classic, of that there's no doubt. Phantom Dust was another game that was made by Microsoft for the Japanese market, one that's generally well liked by the people who played it. And of course it's not like Microsoft didn't try to push the successful American titles. While you could say that the Japanese public didn't really take to Halo, it was still the third best selling Xbox game in the region. Sadly, even with such generally decent games, what Microsoft were trying to do with the Xbox was close to freaking impossible, and they couldn't get close. In 2003, the Xbox was routinely smashed in weekly sales by the PlayStation. And yeah, I mean the PlayStation 1, nine years old at this point. That's the sort of mountain that Microsoft had to climb. And they didn't have much in the way of JRPGs either, which didn't help. It would have really helped if they'd managed to get a relationship with Square. Unfortunately, all the original Xbox had, aside from the Western RPGs, was a port of Fantasy Star Online and, hell, that was on the GameCube too. Ultimately, the Xbox Japan division started to struggle, resulting in layoffs, again not a good thing in the Japanese market. The original Xbox in Japan just couldn't overcome all the obstacles. In the main, the people in Japan just didn't think it was really made for them. As of November 2011, it is estimated that the Xbox only sold 450,000 units in Japan and 2 million in Asia as a whole. That's less than 5% of the 24 million consoles that Microsoft sold worldwide. Dead or Alive 3 was the best selling Xbox game in Japan, with Tecmo being the top developers on the machine by far. And as good as Tecmo were then, it wasn't exactly enough. By 2004, it was time to regroup for the next generation. If Microsoft were to have any chance, they needed to get more companies on board, and they needed some JRPGs to hand. Fortunately, someone was about to come in from the wilderness. Said man from the wilderness was Hironobu Sakaguchi, former vice chairman at Square. Sakaguchi was pretty freaking important back in the 90s. He was the director and then producer of the Final Fantasy series as it became a worldwide phenomenon, one of the highest respected and best loved people working behind the scenes in video games. At one time, he was a sun god. However, it all went wrong after Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, the attempt to take Final Fantasy and make it into a movie. Sakaguchi was the driving force behind the project, ultimately taking the director's chair on it. But it was a massive bomb, losing millions upon millions of dollars. The end result was a huge hit to Square's finances, one of the big reasons why they ended up merging with fellow Japanese RPG makers Enix, and in 2002 Sakaguchi had no choice but to step down from Square completely. In the aftermath he formed his own company, Mistwalker, looking for an opportunity to make JRPGs again. Microsoft of course knew that they absolutely needed RPGs in order to have any chance at all in Japan. They'd tried to get Final Fantasy, but had not succeeded. Sakaguchi and Microsoft were pretty well destined to come across each other, and after a few months of negotiation, it was announced that Mistwalker had signed on to create two JRPGs for the Xbox 360. For the part of the main people in charge of Microsoft's Japanese Xbox push, the likes of Ed Freeze and Seamus Blackley, they were perfectly willing to trust in Sakaguchi's proven track record as a producer, and for the first of these two RPGs, Blue Dragon, they also threw in R2 to do the heavy grunt work. Sakaguchi reunited with two of his most talented cohorts from the Square days, the composer Nobuo Oimatsu, the man who was behind Final Fantasy's music for many years, and the artist Akira Toriyama, creator of the original Dragon Ball manga and key artist on the Almighty Dragon Quest. The pedigree behind Blue Dragon was absolutely undeniable, a solid studio and three of the best minds in the genre. Leo Aim, create a JRPG that will do what seemed at this point to be an almost insurmountable task, sell the Xbox in Japan. It's time to see how they did. Now, I should say quickly, this is going to be first impressions and overview more than anything else, not epic multi-part Final Fantasy review. We did just get off of the F of Hate train after all. The Blue Dragon story starts in media res, with a village that's constantly under attack from this land shark and three plucky kids, Shu, Jiro and Kluke, who try to destroy it. 
Ultimately, the shark turns out to be a ship of the Meshat, and it takes them to a base where some evil bastard named Nini says that he's bullying the village with the ship just for the fun of it. All looks pretty bleak until a mysterious voice gives them some lights to swallow, which suddenly gives them these huge shadows that they can use to smash enemies with. They escape the ship, and their journey begins from there as they try to make their way home and ultimately defeat Nini. Naturally, they'll meet with more people on the way, who'll be their guides on their quest! Story-wise, Blue Dragon is kind of generic as far as RPGs go, pastoral villagers coming up against a domineering technocratic force, but it is graphically very good indeed for the time, and it has a lot of fun with the combat side of things. Blue Dragon's combat is rather fun in that you can largely pick and choose your battles. There are no random encounters, and even boss fights usually come with checkpoints so that you know that you're about to get into something major. Not having random encounters is generally good. One annoying thing about not having them is that you end up just going against the same monsters over and over, but Blue Dragon sorts that through monster fights, a system where you choose to fight different groups of monsters in your area, and those monsters can fight each other. This can be very handy as it distracts a potentially nastier enemy, and lets you take that down while it deals with lesser enemies. And hey, why do all these different monsters always end up on the same side anyway? You'd have thought there would be some sort of food chain or classification at work, but there really is in JRPGs. Blue Dragon deals with that quite nicely. There's plenty more variety in combat, either in the different classes that you can pick for your shadow, or the various timing-based antics you do to maximise your attacks to always keep it engaging. And it's a good thing too, because Blue Dragon can be pretty grindy. Even the first proper boss of the game can give you a tough time if you're not prepared enough. You want to get some levels going first. Of course, fighting bosses is always fun no matter what, because you get to hear Eternity and find out exactly what Nobuo Oematsu wanted to do once he was away from Square. Why, he wanted to create a fast hard rock son with no lesser figure than Ian frickin' Gillen screaming complete nonsense down the mic. It's certainly one of the more interesting boss themes ever, and naturally it's kind of awesome. I guess your mileage may vary on that one, but <laughs> it's hard not to appreciate it on some level. Just as it's hard to not appreciate searching the stools of defeated monsters and finding gold in them. Are there issues with the game? Yeah, a couple. It should be said that the game does suffer a fair bit of slowdown. There's a lot of it in combat, especially when you're doing spells or the monsters are doing complex attacks. It can also make meters a bit jittery, which means they're a little annoying to time properly. Technically that's a bit disappointing, although people have noted that Blue Dragon is compatible with the Xbox One, and if you play it on there then a lot of these slowdown issues are fixed. Other than that though, Blue Dragon is a fun and breezy JRPG. It has the light touch of a Kingdom Hearts, but with a simpler plot. Considering that it's the first proper JRPG to appear on a Microsoft system, it's a pretty damn good way to kick things off. The pedigree of the team really comes out in the setting, and in Toriyama's fantastic monster designs. It's a hell of a lot more Dragon Quest than Final Fantasy, with a style that's somewhat similar to the then recent Dragon Quest VIII, and it's pretty damn good for that. In the end, did Blue Dragon work? Yes, it did. Far, far more than anything else that Microsoft had tried in Japan up to that point. It was estimated that as of April 2006, Microsoft had only sold just over 100,000 Xbox 360s in Japan, actually less than the amount of original Xbox consoles they sold at launch. Blue Dragon changed that big time. A special Blue Dragon edition of the console sold out immediately, and the game ultimately hit its target of 200,000 copies sold in 2007, one of the best-selling games that Microsoft released in Japan, full stop. It even managed to get an anime adaptation in 2007 that lasted for two seasons. Blue Dragon was finally a title that managed to get people's attention, and one big consequence of that was being able to get more JRPGs onto the system. Blue Dragon would be followed in the years to come by other big selling Xbox exclusives, from Namco's Tales of Vesperia to a horde of games by the now signed up Square Enix, Infinite Undiscovery, The Last Remnant, and Star Ocean 4 The Last Hope, the latter of which would ultimately be the most successful Xbox 360 title in the country. Meanwhile, Mistwalker would move on to their second 360 exclusive RPG, 2008's Lost Odyssey, with Sakaguchi still at the helm and Oyamatsu retained for music along with a group of developers named Feel Plus who'd worked on games like Legend of Dragoon and Shadow Hearts. If you were to sum up Lost Odyssey in a sentence, then... Well, if Blue Dragon is Mistwalker's attempt to get a Dragon Quest-style game on the 360, then Lost Odyssey is Mistwalker taking on Final Fantasy. 
that's not wholly accurate at all, but it sort of works. It took four years to make, and it somewhat bucks the trends of the JRPG genre of the time in that it's a very traditional JRPG. It's more surprising to see random encounters here than it is to not see random encounters in Blue Dragon, as games were largely moving away from them. But the battle system itself is engaging beyond simple physical attacks and magic, particularly when combining the two. If Lost Odyssey's battle system and gameplay are for the most part generic, however, the story is anything but. Lost Odyssey largely covers the tale of Kaim Arganar, a soldier who we're introduced to in a big battle between the Ur, who he's fighting for, and the Kent. In the middle of this battle, a meteor strikes killing virtually everybody except him. Kaim, you see, is immortal. He is a mercenary whose existence pretty much consists of moving from battle to battle for one side or another. Because of his proficiency and the fact that he cannot be killed, his services are somewhat prized in a world where different states bicker over magical energy and are frequently at war with each other. But his existence is something of a curse that he is all too aware of, and his past before he became immortal is largely unknown to him, aside from fragments that disturb him in his dreams. Kaim is not the only immortal in the world, we will see others, but this is largely his story. Lost Odyssey as an RPG goes for a more personal and psychological tale, mostly written by Sakaguchi himself, but someone else also did writing on the game, Kiyoshi Shigematsu, a best-selling Japanese novelist. Shigematsu contributes fragments from Kaim's life in visual novel form that are told every so often and grouped together in A Thousand Years of Dreams. You unlock more stories as you play through. They are quite beautifully written, and I certainly shouldn't spoil any of them, but geez, just the first one of them had me kind of emotional. It certainly gets across the sadness of Kame's existence, no doubt about that, and chances are the story will get its hooks into you pretty quickly if you let it. The quality of these little stories is perhaps worth the cost of admission alone with this game, to be honest. As a game, Lost Odyssey was largely praised indeed for its story, and rightly so, there's not many RPGs that go in this direction to be honest. It's also graphically incredible, with plenty of talent working on the game and a big dollop of steampunk, which again calls to mind titles like FF6 and FF7. Some people did complain about a few things, the battle system isn't as interactive as some, not even Blue Dragon, and was thought of as quite antiquated. Like Blue Dragon, the game can also chug along quite a bit in cutscenes and in battle, although again the game is available to play on the Xbox One and I do not know how that affects or improves performance. On the whole though, yes, this is a game that's worth playing for sure. It's long and you'll probably want to have a box of tissues handy, but there's undoubtedly a lot to say about how this game tells a story. Way more than I can fit in here. Lost Odyssey was generally successful on release, although not quite as much as Blue Dragon. In the end it shifted about 110,000 copies in Japan. Not bad for the Xbox over there, although you would have hoped that the game would have shifted a bit more perhaps and kept up Blue Dragon's momentum. Perhaps the older style of the game was a bit of a turn off over there? I'm not sure about that one. It would be Mist Walker's final RPG release on the Xbox 360. A third announced RPG, Cry On, ended up going into development hell and was cancelled in December of 2008, with Mist Walker citing the poor economic conditions of the time as the reason for its demise. A high budget JRPG, on a system with a relatively small user base, was just not viable. Six years later, Sakaguchi released a trailer for the unreleased title. The cancellation was described as a shame by most considering the quality of the two games that preceded it. However, Mistwalker are still around today. Their most recent major RPG is 2011's The Last Story for the Wii, although they apparently have something unnamed in the pipeline. These two RPGs certainly helped to lift the Xbox's reputation in Japan. Sure, there wasn't anywhere to go but up in most people's minds, but they certainly contributed. However, as good as they are, no RPG was ever able to make the Xbox a major must-have in the market. Leaving aside the usual it's an outsider stuff, it seems the Japanese public had some technical misgivings about the 360. One that's often cited is that, what with RPGs being so big there, the market leans heavily on the quality of cutscenes, usually video based ones. While the 360 usually matched well technically with the PS3, indeed often beaten it when it came to how games generally performed, in the video quality market? It's not a contest, the PS3's higher capacity Blu-ray discs meant that HD quality video was straightforward whereas the 360's regular DVDs could not provide that. It's not something we'd perhaps care about too much in the West, but in Japan? Yeah, that was always a major blow against the Xbox 360, 
It meant that when it came to big multi-platform names like, say, Final Fantasy XIII, everyone flocked to the PS3 version and not many people at all bought the Xbox 360 one. That's just one example, of course. The larger picture is that in the end, the Xbox 360 would always struggle in the market and Microsoft weren't going to be able to and eventually were not particularly willing to put in the huge monetary and personal commitment required for the system to potentially improve. They were always fighting a losing battle and that aforementioned economic downturn in the late 2000s didn't help much either. Gradually, Microsoft pulled away from the market as the 360's generation progressed further and further until ultimately, we reach the sort of headlines that we covered at the start of this video. Of course, such headlines are dependent on other factors. It was in January, after all. The Xbox in Japan certainly serves a niche today, however small. There's an expat market, of course, and just as there are Japanophiles over here, there's a Japanese equivalent that prefer the Western styles. And of course, the Xbox One in general has struggled against the PS4 on a worldwide scale. What's happening in Japan isn't special in that regard, it's just even more pronounced. At this stage, it doesn't seem likely that the state of play is going to change anytime soon. Still, it cannot be said that Microsoft didn't try their best with Japan, and they sure as hell had some good games to try and do it with. But it was always going to be pretty damn difficult. Bye for now. Xbox on. Thanks for watching this video that's all about the rather mixed fortunes of the Xbox in Japan. If you like this video then please do like it, follow me on my assorted social media that you can find in the description, and you could also follow me on Patreon where you can find things like cover tapes, early access to my videos, um, Skype chats, and exclusive Patreon streams. I would like to thank the following, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Audie Sawley, Conformist, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, George Newton, Graham Blackpore, Guy Middleton, Ian Roberts, James Id, James Loveridge, Jason Derso, Jason Goy, Jason Leach, Jason Stevens, Johan Eriksson, John Scott, Josh Jensen, L. O'Brien, Lee Norris, ManagerSim.net, Mark Heslop, Mark Johnston, Mark Whittington, Martin Pataki, Nanette McCrone, Olaf Albing, Pete Morris, Peter Sidorn, Phil Taprog, Piotr Margell, Rachel Maxwell, Romeo, Ryan Wyatt Coleman, Sean Zoltek, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Taylor Armand, The Unnatural, Tan Yu Twisted Squote, Vishar D, and Yurka Operator.